Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Hefama and Farm Access. Apologies for starting behind time. We had some technical issues. So at today's webinar, we'll be looking at practical steps in reusing COVID-19 in your facility. So we'll have one speaker and after that we'll have um, duration of time for questions and answers. So today it is really about you. So all the questions and all the concerns you have about COVID-19, this is your opportunity to ask and get the information you require. Um, if you have questions, please ask them in the Q&A panel and our team will try and respond during the designated question and answer break. If we're unable to attend to your questions because of time, and then we'll, report, we'll respond to you via email. Because we have a number of people joining us from different parts of the world, we're very likely to experience technical issues. Please forgive us ahead, but we'll do our best to respond to everybody. My name is Peggy Imunyovu, and I work with Farm Access Foundation as a quality manager, and I'll be moderating this session. Now I'll be handing over to the Executive Secretary of EFAMA, Dr. Idowu, to give us her opening remarks. Dr. Idowu, please. Thank you, Peggy. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome each and every one of us to this webinar. Um, first and foremost, I want to apologize for starting late. It's due to technical issues. Um, but um, we know the importance of having this uh, webinar. We know that COVID-19 pandemic is a public health crisis and it has far-reaching effects and one of the ways we are trying to use to control it is to prevent the spread of the, uh, the disease amongst health workers. Um, uh, suffice to say, in the last uh, couple of weeks, over 100 health workers have been uh, infected with uh, COVID-19 and we we'll need to step up the information we are passing out concerning infection prevention and control. And that's why we have um, organized this webinar again in conjunction with Farm Access to be able to safeguard the lives of our patients and as well um, empower the healthcare workers to um, ensure that they are able to perform their roles in a in a safe way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ido. So our speaker for today is Dr. Folari Opawe, who is a physician with specialized specialization in infectious disease. He obtained his medical degree from the University of Illinois Teaching Hospital before proceeding for advanced training in infectious disease at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital and Amin Kanu Teaching Hospital. He was one of the first indigenous doctors involved in the Nigerian Ebola emergency response in 2014, and he has been involved in several other outbreaks. His research interests include antimicrobial stewardship, infection prevention and control, and outbreak investigations. Dr. Powery currently serves as an infectious disease physician in Lagos University Teaching Hospital and the infection prevention and control team lead for Lagos COVID-19 Emergency Operations Center. He is also a member of the Nigerian Infectious Disease Society, where he currently serves as the PRO. Beyond his medical profession, Dr. Opawe is an expert compare and an award-winning public speaker. So I'll hand over to Dr. Opawe to take us through today's session. Over to you, Dr. Opawe. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be with you uh, once again at um, at a farm access and a farmer uh, with a wonderful collaboration in trying to uh, prevent this scourge called, called COVID-19. Uh, we have been watching this coming from all over the world. Now we can finally say it's here and it's here and we have to learn how we can protect ourselves. So quickly in the next uh, 30 minutes, we'll be going on a journey together on practical steps in preventing COVID-19 in your health facility. And uh, these have been, this, this is not theory. We have looked at the, we have looked at the environment around us. We have looked at how we can adapt these things to our own um, environment in Nigeria and in Africa as a whole. Uh, this is the outline that we are going to be following through this presentation. So just come with me as we start this robust journey on how we can all protect ourselves as all front care workers, frontline workers in the care 
of uh, COVID-19. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, COVID-19, as we all know, again, just a quick reminder, was first discovered in Wuhan, China, in December 2019, when a cluster of pneumonia cases were seen. Nobody, was, uh, nobody knew the etiology, and by January 9, a new virus was discovered. And, uh, you know, the WHO declared it as a disease of public health, as, as a public health emergency of international importance in January 30, 2020. Uh, we had the first case in Nigeria in February 25. Of, uh, which was, uh, who was an Italian national who came into the country, came from Italy via Turkish Airlines. Uh, he came to Lagos, by West Street, to Ogu State. And uh, very brilliant doctors in Ogu State at the clinic there who saw him and uh, had a very low, very low threshold, a very high index of suspicion. Immediately, they referred him to Lagos for testing, and it was discovered in uh, February 27th. The, uh, by 11th of March, the WHO has declared the coronavirus uh, as a global pandemic, and uh, the disease itself was called COVID-19, and the virus was called SARS-CoV-2. Uh, March 16 was when the first case in Lagos was actually discovered, which was called the Lagos case. Which was a young man who traveled in from the UK on the 13th, and the diagnosis was made uh, on the 16th. And we have gone from that one case, uh, as of yesterday, currently, they just have 6,401 cases and 192 deaths. Next slide. And, and we can see the graph, and this is how it goes. In every country that, uh, that, that, that has ha experienced this outbreak of coronavirus, it goes from very gentle, very, very, very gradual, and then there's this steep rise. Oh, you know, we went on for one case, we had two cases, we had cases in tens for so long, and all of a sudden we can see how there's a logarithmic explosion of these cases. Also, the deaths follow the same pattern. You know, initially it seems so calm, and then it starts, it, it starts going on a very steep rise. Uh, our hope is just that uh, we wouldn't have that kind of scenario in Nigeria, but again, there's no scientific reason why this would not happen, because this, has, this is what has happened all over the world. Next slide. Uh, you know, the, the, the reality is that COVID-19 has totally changed the way we think and approach situations. And the truth is that we have not seen anything like this before. There's nothing that has shut down the entire world like this. In world, in recent history, in recent history, even the world wars uh, didn't do this. It has changed the way we live. All industries have had to change their operations, and uh, the, the healthcare industry also had to adapt. And we have to evolve our practices to cope with this virus because we are the ones in the front lines, and we have to be careful in how, seeing how we can cope with this virus, how we can live with this virus, at the same time preserving our lives. Next slide. When you look at the world of sports, for example. Football matches have been cancelled. Liverpool now, we don't know whether they will win the league or not. Sorry to Liverpool fans. Major tournaments have been postponed. The Olympics, you know, the only time this happens is during World Wars. The Olympics has had to be postponed. Tokyo 2020 will not be done in 2021, though it will still be called Tokyo 20. You know, in a pushback against the virus, that look, we have to consider our lives. But this league has started the last weekend, and there has been major changes in the way the sport is played. We don't know how long these changes will last. Next slide. Now, for example, this is Borussia Dortmund. They played a game against Schalke 04 over the weekend. And normally we can see how, uh, how you celebrate goals. Goals is a thing of great joy to the team. Unfortunately, you know, over the weekend, when because of the new coronavirus challenge, we can see how Eric Bot Allard was celebrating his goal alone, away from his teammates, and the match was actually played in an empty stadium. So these are the realities of life. Well, these are things that are totally unthinkable several uh, so, so weeks to months ago. You can't celebrate, uh, celebrate a goal alone. It's seen as maybe you are fighting with the rest of your team, but that's the new reality that we all have to embrace and we have to adapt to. Next slide. Also, we can see, uh, you know, we can see uh, these are restaurants, these are eateries that have had to modify. You can see the barriers they are putting to ensure that there's social distancing we did the uh, we did their we did their uh, their facilities. We can see the distance between the people buying the food and the people selling them. All these things are done in a bid to um, ensure that there's appropriate distancing and that uh, these these are ways in which different industries have evolved to the challenge of coronavirus. Next slide. This is another restaurant, and we can see here there has been bias. The sitting areas have been roped off. You cannot sit down. Just walk in buy your food and, and go. Next slide. 
you know, so these are the things that we have to look at also in the health care, in the health industry. Now, uh, you know, sorry about that. Now, as at today, actually, the number is not 200, the number is 300. More than 300 healthcare workers have been infected in Lagos alone. You know, and uh, it, seven, about 70% of them are asymptomatic. Most of them are from private hospitals. And we have had four deaths as of today. In fact, the last, I got news of the latest death just after, um, after doing this slide. Just, just, that was just yesterday. You know, very, very sad news. Next slide. When, when we analyzed the healthcare worker infections in Lagos, as at the time when we had 193 healthcare workers that were infected, we analyzed it and we did a chart to show the different cadres. And one thing that is very clear is that there is nobody that is left, uh, that is left unskated. We can see if drivers are involved, we had four drivers, administrative staff, they are involved, six of them, security, six, pharmacists are there, cooks. Cooks, you wonder what, what are cooks doing with the patient? But everybody in the health facility is involved in this, radiographers, physiologists. Of course, the nurses and the doctors bear the brunt of it because about 44 nurses at that time and 52 doctors. Again, I told you this number has really increased now, but this is just primary data that we have. Next slide. When we looked at the doctors, we looked at the CADA. They had, we had two house officers at that time, four residents, four medical officers, six consultants, and about 33 medical officers that we're not really sure it was all specified. But this shows that regardless of the level of training, regardless of the age, regardless of the level of experience, everybody was involved in this outbreak. Next slide. No, so I, 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 and it's so sad, you know, at this point to also, you know, probably dedicate this webinar to Dr. Lushegu George, the MD of Jayola Clinic Shomolu, who lost his life also to the scourge of the coronavirus yesterday. So these things are realities that we have to deal with. We all know one or two people who have been sick. We probably know one or two people who have died. And the reality is that we cannot afford to lose our members. So we cannot afford to lose this very experienced hand because it's going to become a serious crisis to the health industry uh, in the future. So the question is this, uh, for every infection, there's what we call a chain of infection. And this chain consists of six links. And this chain, the link has to be completed from the infectious agent to the susceptible host before there can be an infection. There are six links in the chain. Number one is the infectious agent, two is the reservoir, the third one is the portal of exit, the fourth one is the mode of transmission, the fifth, the portal of entry, and the sixth is the susceptible host. What we are going to do today is to look at how we can break every chain. Because when we can break any link in this chain, we can actually prevent ourselves from getting infected by this coronavirus. The interesting thing with this chain is that the closer to the top of the chain, the top of the chain being the infectious agent number one, that you can break it, the better, the more protected the person is. Next slide. So when we look at the coronavirus, for example, I mean, we can look at this chain of transmission of various infections and illnesses. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? You know, so, and we can look at it for various infections. Now, if you're looking at it, for example, if you're looking at HIV, the infectious agent is the HIV virus itself. The reservoir is, uh, the, the, is humans, you know, or like things like rabies that is in dogs or cats or bats, but the reservoir of HIV is in humans. And the portal of exit is through the, uh, the, the genital fluids, either the semen, semen or the vaginal fluids. The mode of transmission is basically primarily sexual contact. We know that HIV can also be in blood, so it can be transmitted through the blood, through transmission of blood or usage of shafts or through uh, inadvertent um, venipuncture or something. You know, the portal of entry again is through the genital fluids, genital system of the recipient, and it can also be through the vascular system, through the blood, and the host has to be susceptible. HIV, for example, there are some people that they would get infected with HIV, we call them elite non progressors. They have it, the virus, but they are not susceptible to it. So this, this is an example of how this chain builds up for every infectious disease. This chain has to be there, and that's the only way that the person, that people can actually get infected. Our job in IPC is to make sure you, at the level of number six, the susceptible host, does not become the reservoir. So the infectious agent in SARS-CoV-2 in COVID is SARS-CoV-2. That's the virus. The reservoir is the respiratory secretion. That is where it is. It is inside humans, inside our respiratory secretion. For those who are infected. The portal of exit, how does it get out of the body is through the respiratory droplets. The mode of transmission is probably droplets. It's a droplet infection, but it can also be through the contact 
That is where these droplets land on the mucous membrane, they lose the eyes and the mouth, and it can be what we call the opportunistic airborne, because it becomes airborne under certain circumstances. I should be clear that based on the information we have now, COVID is not primarily airborne, like TB, like measles, like chickenpox. Those are airborne infections. But COVID can become airborne under certain circumstances. I'm going to discuss that in this uh, series. Portal of entry, how does it enter the next person? It's through the nose, the eyes, and the mouth. And the susceptible host, we know that everybody can have COVID, but the people who are susceptible to it are the elderly people and the immunocompromised. So let's move on. Now, we are going to, let's move on, please. Thank you very much. Let's move on. So now we're going to start from the top of the chain, which is the infectious agent. We know the infectious agent is the coronavirus. So the question now is, how do we get rid of this infectious agent? What can we do? Next slide, please. Next slide. So how do we break the chain at the level of the infectious agent? Next slide. Thank you very much. So at the level of the infectious agent, we are looking at use of vaccines to prevent you from getting infected in the first place. We can treat, we can do ant hygiene, and we can do the decontamination. Next slide, please. Now, the unfortunate thing with the coronavirus is that so far we have not had any vaccines. Uh, there's, there are vaccines in development, no effective one has been announced. There are two, three days ago, Moderna announced that there are some promising results, but there are just eight patients there in that particular child that had antibodies, so we're not sure. And for treatment, again, please, let's be very clear, there is no proven drug. There is no proven treatment for the coronavirus. A lot of drugs are being used. Uh, basically, in Lagos State, for example, we use loquinavir, ritonavir. Uh, other drugs include hydroxychloroquine, zitromycin, doclizumab, remdesivir. All these drugs are still undergoing trials. Remdesivir seems to be promising, but so far, uh, we don't have any concrete data on whether it can really protect. So as far as treatment and vaccines, there's nothing we can do about that. But what can we do something about? We can do something about getting rid of the infectious agent through ant IG. What ant IG does is to get rid of the virus on the hands, which are the greatest transmitters of infection anywhere. And we can do the contamination, cleaning and disinfection, where we get rid of the virus on surfaces. The virus can be on these surfaces and we can get infected when our hands touch these surfaces, and then we touch the hands to our eyes, nose, or mouth. Next slide. So, uh, we're looking at ad IG, which is the crux of infection prevention and control. There's nothing you are doing in IPC, nothing, that ad IG is not involved in, because the ants are the greatest transmitters of infections. They are the ones that go everywhere. And it's very key and very crucial for us to have, uh, to, to, to have our hands clean at every point. So, ad IG, we remember, can be done with soap and water. It's better for you to use liquid soap. The egg bath soap is what you have, we can manage it. The liquid soap is better. And it's important that when you are using this liquid soap, it should not be diluted. A lot of us dilute this soap so that it can be plenty. But you, are, you should realize that when you do that, it reduces the effectiveness. Now, our alcohol based hand drop is also another option. It's important to note that the alcohol content must at least be 60%. 60 to 80% is what is recommended. So, Google and Dry Gin will not work because I've seen some places where they tell you that you can use a Google if that's what you find. Please, that's very dangerous. And remember that these things are supposed to be used to wash your hands and you should not drink it. You know, because some also use that as an option. 0.05% uh, chlorine is another thing that we can use, you know, in, uh, in doing ant IG. There are several steps to ant IG and all that. Uh, we will not go into the details of ant IG in this lecture. But all health facilities should have ant IG stations at all entrances and exits, uh, at, at all points, in the, uh, at different strategic points in the facility. This is very, very important. This is one adaptation that we have to do in a bit to protect ourselves. Everybody entering any facility now must wash their hands, either using their call and wash, using soap and water, or using 0.05% chlorine. Next slide. Now, it is better to have multiple options at the entrance. One thing we have seen is that some, uh, some facilities, they have only one hand wash station, maybe just one uh, alcohol-based hand wash or one uh, sink uh, with soap and water. So we can see that this, this, this is not the best. You should have multiple options so that you don't have crowding. Because you remember that social distancing is one of the key things in control the spread of this virus. Job aids and visual reminders should also be available at these hard stations. Next slide. So for example, this is a particular facility here in Lagos that uh, you can see there are two hard stations that are there and they're very, 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 very beautifully designed. There's water is there, soap is there. 
one soap is enough for the two, one person can borrow soap for the other sick. And you can see the uh, the top eight that are there. These were actually de designed with uh, by farmer and fa farm access, all in the build as a visual reminder. Okay, these are the steps of hand washing, and this is very good. And these are things that all of us should have in all our facilities. We can see some of farmer staff trying to also obey the instructions and washing their hands right at the facility. So at every facility now, the security must be there to instruct that everybody coming in must wash their hands. If you are coming to the facility 10 times a day, then you must wash your hands 10 times a day. There's nothing like, oh, I've just washed my hands now. No, we are not going to hear that. You must wash your hands again and again. And this visual is very good. Next slide. Next slide. So uh, also, like I said, there are different options. Can we go to the previous slide? Thank you very much. These are alcohol-based hand drop. Again, reminder, sanitize your hands. You know, these reminders help. It, it gingers that process. So that when you are walking by, even if there's no security man there or whatever to tell you, you can sanitize it. And these are alcohol-based hand drop. And then we can also see these uh, wonderful buckets that we call Veronica buckets. They were actually invented by or, or, or discovered, uh, invented by a woman called a public health uh, physician called Veronica Beko in Ghana. Who try to solve this problem of hand washing because the reality in hand washing is that you must use running water and so we know also know the reality of our times that before we start creating plumbing walls creating a drainage building a sink and all that this is a very cheap and very effective option just have your veronica bucket there put a bucket under it to collect your waste where the water is full like the one on the right is almost getting full you go and pour it away and then you have solved the problem that's the soap there for washing there next slide so uh, I, for the Veronica buckets, these things are easily available. And uh, it's important that when we are using our taps, we should have taps that can easily open and close with your elbow. Very, very important. You know, like the one on the left and the one on the right, these are taps you can easily open and close with your elbow. So you don't have to use your hands and you don't have to worry with your hands to close it when you are done with hand washing. It's also good to remember that when you finish hand washing, we have two options. Either we dry with towel, with a paper towel, we can use kitchen tissue so you can hang that on a rack just around the place where they are doing hand washing. Or people are encouraged to air uh, dry. So these are two options that we can use. And these facilities will be available in all our, uh, in, in, in all our centers. Next slide. So uh, we can also use chlorine solutions. But it's very, very important for us that when we are making these chlorine solutions, uh, you know, to, to understand that we have to be careful when preparing bleach uh, solutions. Rubber gloves should be worn and goggles to protect the eye from splashes. Uh, bleach should be mixed with cold water, please, not hot water. Hot water renders it ineffective. And then you have to prepare the solution daily and discard unused ones. Chlorine lyses in sunlight. So by the time sunlight acts on it, it lyses it and it does because water is no longer effective anymore. And then 0.05% chlorine is what is recommended for hand washing. So that's the problem sometimes with chlorine. Some people over dilute, some people under dilute. Uh, we are going to be taking how to prepare these solutions in yet another lecture series, but not now. But it's very important to note that chlorine can be dangerous. It can cause dermatitis, it can cause breakages in the skin. And for some people, it can actually cause some respiratory difficulty for them. So chlorine is cheap. You know, we can find it in bleach, but it has these problems. So uh, sometimes we, we, we rather recommend that you use your soap and water or use your alcohol-based adult, especially if you are not involved in diet care of COVID patients and you are just trying to protect yourself, your staff, and the community. This is very crucial. Thank you very much. Next slide. Okay, so now we have talked about the infectious agent. We are not going to move on to the reservoir. And we have talked about, now, I told you that the closer you get to the host, the more difficult it is to control and to keep this infection. So we're going to talk about how we can break the chain at the level of the reservoir. Next slide. So like we said earlier, the reservoir of an infectious agent as a definition, is the habitat in which the infectious agent normally lives, grows, and multiplies. For SARS-CoV-2, the reservoir is humans. It is living in humans. It's not living on the road. It's not living on the streets. It doesn't live in dogs. It doesn't live anywhere else. It lives in human beings. So it's very, very important for us to note now, 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 now the problem with the coronavirus, and that's why it has been very difficult keeping this reservoir, is that there are asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic carriers who are capable of transmitting the infection. So we can, it's difficult to identify who is actually positive. What we know is that people start spreading the infection from two days before to 14 days after. That is when they are, they, they are, they are, they are shedding the virus actively and they are infectious. 
And so, because of these asymptomatic carriers, it becomes very difficult to know who is actually carrying what. And that's a problem with screening, which we have to face the reality that eventually there is no country in the world that was able to stop coronavirus at the airports. And that is why, despite all the screening levels at the airports, what we eventually tried to do was to make sure that we, there was a lockdown so that it stopped all movement. So what you need to do as part of the reservoir, which is in humans, is to stop having screening points where you screen the patient and you suspect, you isolate, and then from there, you move the patient to an holding area. The holding area is supposed to keep the patient with some care, depending where the patient is evacuated to a treatment site. Next slide. So all efforts should be made to ensure that COVID-19 patients do not get into the general flow of the health facility without taking necessary precautions. Now, having said this, I should also let you know that despite your best efforts, there is a very high chance that you may still fail because of the protein manifestations of disease in this, in, this, in this patient. And also because some people may not have the infection initially and they can have the infection later as you are moving into the facility. So it is very important to realize that. Now, all hospitals must have a closed entry port manned by trade security or front desk personnel. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not the time where anybody can just walk into a hospital. It's not allowed. We have had cases in Lagos where people walked into hospitals and, you know, but it was, they had already entered the facility, but they discovered that they were COVID positive patients and you can kill the pandemonium, you can kill the, the kind of crisis that they caused. So you must have a closed gate. There must be a, a form of barrier that is not allowing a patient to just walk into the facility. You must have a screening questionnaire for all entry into the facility, both for staff and for patients. And this is very important. A lot of times we forget that anybody can get infected with this thing. So the emphasis is on without, and we forget the enemy within. The experience we've had in Lagos is that many facilities, many healthcare workers, doctors, cooks, security men that get, got infected, they got infected through another healthcare worker. So our screening should be for everybody, whether staff or for patients. When they are coming in, their temperature should be checked and should have a basic symptom check. Now, it is very important to communicate clearly to the patients and staff about your protocols. Now, we know private facilities, the patient is coming in, he, 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 he demands a level of service. And so all of a sudden, this man has been coming to your facility for 15, 20 years. Now you are telling him to wait, stop here. You are asking him funny questions. He wants to see the doctor, the security man that is talking to him or the receptionist. This people can get angry. And so you must send a kind of message to them, even before now, that look, this is what is going on. It is very clear so that everybody understands. And once everybody understands, it becomes easier to comply. Patients must be screened in their cars or a screening tent. Now, every facility, you don't just allow patients to come down from their cars. So your gates should be closed, and then you have the security go and ask questions right outside the facility. Sorry, can we go back to the previous slide, please? You know, so it is also good when you have a written notice. A written notice, you can send messaging to communicate to your patients. Now, look, these are the new protocols because of the current circumstances. And when there are difficult cases, there should be a clear way it can be escalated to top management to deal with it in case you have difficult patients. Next slide. So, security should be thought to wear their face masks properly and keep their distance from the patient while screening. So, when a patient comes in, it doesn't mean that you should go and put your face inside the patient's mouth. But when you are screening the security, because if the security can act as a point of entry to the facility. So, it's very important that you also train the security properly. They should wear their mask and keep their distance from the patient. You must have written down protocols and SOPs for your facility. It's very important. The, the advantage of writing something down is that it makes it clear. It is written that it is clear. There's a company policy and everybody can work with it. And then there must be a clear level of communication from the security to the medical staff on duty. Now, we know the security is not supposed to make these decisions. You know, but at the same time, you must have a clear level of communication. Now, okay, when the security flags a patient, what next? What do we do? What is the next step? You know, it must be a very, very clear, precise line. And you must actually run drills to ensure that there is no problem. All facilities will have an IPC focal person to liaise with the relevant authorities. The job of this focal person is to make sure that your protocols in the facility are followed, and this person is the person that will liaise with the authorities to ensure that everything is fine. Now, this is very important, please, this is very crucial, that no patient, please, I beg again, no patient should be turned away without a concrete line of action. What we are seeing now is patients being rejected at healthcare facilities because of a suspicion of COVID. 
and some of them roam around, get to five, six, seven hospitals. Eventually, some of them die in the house. I still got a report this morning of a young man who died at home, suspected COVID case, wasn't accepted in an hospital. So we shouldn't just turn patients away. There must be a clear line, a clear concrete plan of action before they leave. Next slide. Next slide. So this is an example of a screening form, for example. Can we go back? You know, at this screening form, you remember that any of these sites that any of the patient has, uh, you know, it should, it should be picked up. And if a patient has any of these sites, the patient should be flagged. And once the patient is flagged, you invite the senior uh, medical staff on duty to come in to make a decision. And once they make a decision, then they can move on. So one of the things we can do is to reduce unnecessary contact with the patient. Remember, these are reservoirs. You don't want the reservoirs to come to you at all. So how can we do this? We can do telemedicine, telephone consults, and WhatsApp calls should be encouraged. All patients don't have to come. We have to find a way of charging for these things. So when they just come in, they come in like that. And then when they come in, you know, they, so your, the patient is not even coming at all. You just consult, hello, sir, how are you? Yes, how's everything? What's your blood pressure? Check it. Okay, this is it. Increase your amylo DP from 5 milligrams to 10 milligrams. You have done your consultation, and you can charge for it. So it's very important for us to look at how we can do all the, grow our, on our telemedicine skills. Clinic business should be based on appointments, which must be well spaced to prevent overcrowding. You know the number of doctors, nurses, and staff and patients that your facility can take. And it is very important for you now to be able to schedule your clinic visits so that in such a way that one person has left before another person comes. Drug refills can be done without clinic visits. Work is should be reduced to the barest minimum. Cashless policy should be encouraged. There's no need to be uh, handing over cash now. Just do your transfer. Send your transfer, you know, and then it is better. All these things are done to reduce unnecessary contact with patient, patient relatives or visitors. Only one visitor should be allowed by patient to the facility. We have to review our visiting rules. This is not the time that one, man, one grandma is coming and five people are coming with her. It's not allowed. Only one person is okay. And emergency should be attended to using standard precaution. It's very important. It's not as if we should not take care of emergencies. But every emergency that we have should be attended to using standard precautions. It's very important. Next slide. This is an example for, of a screening tent outside the facility, for example. I can see the patient seated outside there waiting. This is to reduce the load inside the facility. So when the current uh, number of people in the facility leave, then another person can, uh, another set can come in. So this is how you control your space so that there's social distancing and, uh, you know, the reservoirs, everybody keeps their own virus to themselves or whatever else they are carrying. Next slide. So, all suspected cases should be isolated and not allowed to enter the general floor of the facility. This is very important. Because by the time a suspected case has entered your the facility, then it's, all, it's, all, it's already getting too late. All hospitals or all healthcare facilities should have a holding area to keep suspects pending their evacuation. This is very crucial. Because you can't just keep a breathless patient in the sky while waiting for, uh, for the states to come and pick up the patient or call the NCDC or whatever. It is very important to have a holding area in your facility where you can administer some form of care while you are waiting for the patient to be evacuated into a treatment center. The holding area should have a different entrance from the rest of the facility. It's best for it to be separated and secluded as much as possible so that there is no flow through that area. Holding area should be clearly labeled. We have seen cases where staff wander into this holding area, not knowing that there is a sick patient there with a suspected case of COVID-19. And then that staff is inadvertently exposed. Care should be provided to the patient using appropriate PPE when even in the OD area. You don't have, want to have a situation where three, four days later, you hear that the patient is positive and then you are in panic because you did not take precautions. Precautions should be taken. Appropriate PPE should be worn while taking care of these patients, even in the OD area. Next slide. There we go. There mm -hmm. should be staff dedicated to the care of the patient. We always encourage that anytime you have a suspected case, case not all staff should go there. Once somebody has started seeing, that person should continue the care until, uh, until they, are, they are done. So that in case there's an exposure, the exposure is limited and the entire Entire's is not exposed unnecessarily. All the areas should be well ventilated and have a different shape of the rest of the facility. This is very important. Because the mistake we keep, we keep making in this part of the world is that our entire that is one giant cooling box. And so some people have central AC systems. And this can create serious problems because the virus will just travel from that room and can travel through the entire facility. So when you have a holding area, it's best to have a, if you have an AC unit separate, it should be separate for that place alone. 
Uh, relevant authorities should be notified. Uh, patients should be evacuated as soon as possible. Next slide. Okay, so we've talked about the reservoir. Let's move on to the next chain in the uh, next link in the next slide, please. Thank you very much. So for the portal of exit, this is the third chain. And like I said, the portal of exit and the mouth. So what we are going to do, the portal of exit is through the nose and the mouth. That is how it comes out. So what we try to do here to break the chain is to prevent the virus from escaping, which is what you call source control. Next slide. So how do we how do we take care of the portal of exit here? How do we prevent the virus from escaping? Cough etiquette. All patients with respiratory symptoms, you know, they should be taught to cough into their elbow instead of using their hands. And when they are coughing, if they are going to use their hands, they should cough into tissue. All patients with respiratory symptoms should be given a medical mask. Now, I always say that if you have two face masks in a facility, only, only one face mask in the facility, and you have a patient that is coughing, don't wear the face mask, give it to the patient. Because when you give it to the patient, you have cut off the virus from the source. Patients, please, should not be placed on N95 face masks for any reason. The N95 face mask is extremely, extremely uncomfortable. And you cannot ask a patient to wear this. It's unfair to the patient, and it's not very effective. Other faces that are coming to the facility can be wear, asked to wear cloth masks. Now, we know that the cloth mask is not as effective as the face mask. But the face mask should be absolutely reserved for people that have uh, respiratory symptoms or people that are taking care of the respiratory symptoms so that the cloth mask can be worn by every other person. And, and your facilities are encouraged to have a stock of all these masks in their facility so that when somebody is coming who doesn't have them, you can easily give it to that person and everybody ends up getting protected. Next slide. Okay, what's the mode of transmission? That's the next link in the chain. We are up to number four here. We can see we are moving closer and closer to the susceptible host. The mode of transmission also is very important. What are the things that we can do to break the chain at this mode of transmission? Next slide. The mode of transmission in the coronavirus is basically droplets. It can also be through contact, which can be direct and indirect contact, and sometimes it is airborne. Now, what we are trying to do here is basically we want to prevent the virus from traveling from one person to another. That is how we are going to break the chain. Next slide. So, how do we do this? For droplet infection, social distancing should be observed as much as possible in the facility. Again, this is one mistake doctors make. This is one mistake healthcare workers make. And what we have seen in, in, in outbreaks in Lagos is that healthcare workers still keep clustering in the facility. This is not to be advised. This is not a time to be doing meetings that you are doing wardrobes, 10 people on the wardrobe, five people on the wardrobe. You know, it's not allowed. You know, so as much as could be as possible, social distance should be observed in the facility. A distance of two meters is advised. One meter is okay. But anything, up, anything more than one meter is fine. Online meetings should be encouraged as, as much as possible to reduce clustering for meetings. And personnel should be encouraged to wear face masks and, wear, and use them appropriately and to wear them all the time. Again, the surgical face mask is better, but the cloth face mask can be used as a suitable alternative, especially when you are not in direct care of sick patients. Next slide. And identified face masks should not be worn routinely. Please, this is very crucial. The supply of N95 is greatly all over the world. And in now we are having situations where even in the US, they are using N95 face masks. So N95 masks should not be worn routinely. It should only be reserved for aerosol directing procedures. And we should note that N95 masks with exhalator valves, you can see that small box in front of the mask on the, on the right. That mask, are, that's not good for source control. What that valve does is that it allows you to breathe out, but it controls the breathing in. So if the person with coronavirus wears this one, all the people around him are not protected at all. So it's very, very important for us to note that because I see this mask um, everywhere. So it protects you, the wearer, but it does not protect the environment from you. Next slide. So hand washing is, uh, you know, I told you that this virus can also be through contact, contact with our hands and with our mucous membranes or direct contact. Hand washing is very crucial. Cleaning and disinfection is very important. Again, we are going to leave this for another webinar where I'm going to go into details of cleaning and disinfection in the healthcare facility. Next slide. So 
COVID-19 is not normally airborne, except under circumstances. So we call it opportunistic airborne, rather obligate airborne. And these circumstances include cardiopulmonary resuscitation, nebulization, suctioning, intubation, mechanical ventilation, tracheostomy, or generally what I call critical care procedures. So N95 should be reserved for when you are doing this procedure of patients. So you can wear a surgical face mask to take care of a COVID case if you are not doing any of these things. You are safe, you are fine. But if you are now doing what we call AGPs or aerosol generating procedures, then you should wear a N95 face mask. It is better. Next time. So we have dealt with the portal of exit from the patient. We have dealt with the mode of transmission. Let's now go to the portal of entry. As I've told you, the closer you get to the host, that is you, that is the healthcare worker, that is the doctor, the nurse, the security man, the cook, the cleaner, the gardener, the closer you get there, the more dangerous. So the portal of entry is where we are now in the chain of infection. And at the level of the portal of entry, next slide, is where uh, the PPE comes in. You know, this is where you now protect yourself. And the whole way, next slide, please. The way you break this chain, the way you break this chain is to, the way you break this chain is to prevent the virus from getting into you as a healthcare worker. And this is where PPE comes in. And because this is primarily a respiratory virus, the most important PPE you need is your surgical face mask or your N95. Once you have that and you have your gloves, you are good. You can run anything with this patient. The rest is Dara, as we say. But the most important thing is your surgical face mask and your N95. You can wear your face gloves if there's going to be a splash or whatever. But the most important thing that you must never cease to wear when you're taking care of COVID patients is this face mask. This is where PPE. And you can see how close to be the host the PPE is. And that is why PPE usually fails if you are not careful. Because you have got it so close, you have left so many things and up to the same level of the line of PPE. So that is the challenge. Next slide. So we have now gone to the last link in the chain of infection. We have gone from the infectious agent to the reservoir, the portal of exit, the mode of transmission, the portal of entry, and now we are at you, the susceptible host, you and I. Now, the host, we are the frontline workers, we are the ones that face these things. How, what can we do at this level to try to break the chain? Already, it's already getting too late. So it's very important for us uh, to, to understand that. Next slide. Now, we know that with the coronavirus, susceptible, uh, severe illness can occur in any age group. But we also know that elderly people, that's age greater than 65, you know, the definition of elderly in Nigeria may be a bit different because we, are, we can be young outside but old inside. So elderly people, we know that they are more at risk. People with comorbidities, such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, people who are even suppressed, that have HIV, sickle cell, anemia, chronic kidney disease, all these are people that are more likely to come down with severe illness. We have seen young people die from this virus. We have seen people who are very fine otherwise die from this virus. But we also know that the odds are against you if you have any of these comorbidities. Next slide. So what are we suggesting? What are the requirements? What are the practical ways? We are saying that if anybody that has any of these conditions, you are taking one pill, two pills per day, please work from home as much as possible as much as possible. If you need to hire somebody to be your face, if you need to hire somebody to do the work, you can remain behind the scenes in the facility. If you have someone at home with any of these characteristics, so there's a grandma living with you, there's an old woman living with you, know that you can inadvertently put her at risk. What we are seeing now is doctors getting infected and infecting the rest of their families. So we have to be very careful. So that even if you, as a person, you are not susceptible, then you have to be careful that you do not carry the virus to somebody who is susceptible. So if you have somebody at home or you're in contact with somebody who is having any of these conditions, it is very important, very, very crucial that they also stay protected. So we have had people who have had to leave the house and have an alternative arrangement where they are taking care of COVID patients because of the old people that are living with them at home or people with comorbidities. This is very important. Next slide. So basically, we have gone through uh, the whole chain of infection. We have moved from the infectious agent to the reservoir, to the portal of exit, the mode of transmission, the portal of entry, and to the susceptible host. And we have looked at how we can break this chain at any of these points. I always say that infection prevention and control is both a science and an art. The science is what we have discussed. The art is now how you look at it 
and how you adapt it to your own society, to your own facility, to your own particular center. It is very, very important to know that we have to be very creative when we are coming upon solutions in a way to prevent ourselves. The COVID-19 epidemic and pandemic, rather, is upon us. Healthcare workers, all of us, whether you are taking care of this patient directly or you are anywhere, once you are an healthcare worker, we are all in the front line in this pandemic. One of the people we've had uh, suspected deaths from COVID is a driver, you know, and you have to be very, you know, you know, it's really sad. So everybody is involved and we must be equipped with practical tools to protect ourselves, our patients, our colleagues, and our communities at hand. This has been a particularly trying time for us as doctors. Many of us as nurses, as pharmacists, as med medical lab scientists, as dentists, I'm sure by now we all know somebody who has been sick from this virus. We probably know one or two people who have died. And we don't know how long this will continue. It's not looking like something that will stop at any time. It's very, very important for us to learn these ways we can protect ourselves, how we can adapt and evolve with this virus. And we have to conquer our fear of the virus and not allow the virus to conquer us. Thank you very much. So these are my references. Next slide. Thank you so much for listening. I now await your questions. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Fari. What a time to be alive. So we have a num numbers and numbers of questions. But I was wondering if it would be okay to observe a 30 second silence for Dr. Olushegu of Jayola Hospital, who we have just recently lost. If that's fine, then we can do that for 30 seconds. All right, thank you for observing that uh, respect with us for, on behalf of Dr. Lushegun. So we'll go now into the question and answer section. So the first one here is that, with the continued use of the nose mask by the populace, don't you think this could cause very serious health problems by continued inhalation of carbon dioxide? Dr. Power, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much as well. So basically, uh, we, 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 there is no data that, that that shows that when you use a face mask, uh, you, are, you, are, you are going to have carbon dioxide poisoning. We don't have any data on that, you know. And uh, so I, I know there's that. You know, what WhatsApp has been a very big enemy. You know, somebody just sits down, does a voice note, or does one funny uh, WhatsApp presentation here and there. And I saw that WhatsApp message going around that face mask is dangerous and all that. No, it's not true. It's not true. What we also know, if I could add, is that face mask is not the be all end all of protecting yourself from coronavirus. You know, it's social distancing that should be emphasized. And then when you cannot do social distancing, then you have to use a face mask. That, 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 is, that, that is what we try to teach. That's Dr. Lucia Good George, may, may, may your soul rest in peace uh, as you continue the good fight uh, in, in, uh, and you go to rest in heaven. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so no, no, face mask can be worn without any danger of. Uh, of, of, of carbon dioxide poisoning. You know, thank you very much. All right, thanks. So another person wants to know if um, the presentations will be made available. Yes, everyone who has registered for this webinar will get the presentation as well as answers to the questions that will be asked during this webinar. Okay, so why, why use face masks or does the virus jump at people? Is social or physical distancing not enough? Someone is asking. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Now, what we recommend, like I just said, is social distancing. However, we know social distancing is sometimes impossible. For example, you can't social distance not research. If you have to do, if you're a dentist, for example, which kind of social distance you have to put your nose inside the patient's mouth. So, where social distancing can be done, it is advised. Where it cannot be done, then where, where you have to move close for one reason or the other, then it is encouraged to be on face mask. But what we know is that social distancing is superior to use of face masks. The face mask should be done where social distancing is possible or to be on the safer side, do social distancing plus face masks. Thank you. 
All right, thanks. So someone here wants to know, what's the right way to say? Is it social distancing or physical distancing? I, I think it's a combination of the two, but social distancing is what we say, what we use really. But you can say social distancing, you can say physical distancing. I think it's just uh, whichever suits your fancy. Thank you very much. Thanks. So someone wants to know what the recommended steps are to attending to a patient from entrance of the hospital to their leaving. Yeah, yeah. So we, we've tried to talk about the recommended steps and probably we'll have another series where we talk about standard precautions. Uh, we are getting to a stage. We are not there yet. We are not there yet. But like in the UK, for example, every patient is, uh, is suspected to have COVID until otherwise proven. You know, but we haven't gotten to that level yet. The UK has more than hundreds of thousands of cases. You know, so the steps are some things that we may we will have to probably highlight in another session as to what you can do. But what we just advise is that you take observe standard precautions: respiratory hygiene, using your face mask, cough etiquette, attend the patient with respiratory symptoms early, have a low index of suspicion for taking care of them, and then you know, you see, one thing is that you don't want to hear the story, the news, three, four days later, that ah, that man that we attended to last week was a COVID case, and everybody starts uh, panicking. You want, to, you want to hear that news and be reassured that you protected yourself and your staff were protected. That's the important thing. So the details of that are things that we would have to do some other time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so from the questions that are coming here, um, it's apparent that we need to do this training time and time again, even the ones we had done in the past. Because this question, I think you addressed it at the last uh, webinar, but I'll just ask again in case you have anything more to say to this person. In the management of patients with the virus by healthcare workers, how, at what point are they supposed to wear the full PPE instead of the surgical gown? Also, when are we supposed to wear the N95 mask instead of the surgical mask? So, so there's something in uh, infection prevention and control we call point of care risk assessment, FOCRA, in which, which is saying that what am I going to do for this patient? What level of PPE do I need to wear? For example, if I'm going to do a visual check on a patient and I'm just going in to say, hello, sir, how are you? How is everything? I hope you are fine. I hope you are good. I hope there's nothing wrong with you. Then all I need to do is just to wear a face mask and I'm fine. I'll probably wear my gloves or do my hand hygiene. That's all I need to do. Now, this is different from if I'm trying to transport a patient or if I'm trying to intubate a patient. If I'm going to intubate a patient, then I must put on my N95. I must put on my surgical gown to uh, protect against flashes and secretions and all that. And then in addition to my gloves and my goggles. So that, that, that point of care is something very crucial because that's what determines what you're going to do. What we see sometimes is you see a driver who is driving an ambulance carrying a COVID patient wearing full PPE. And you ask yourself, what exactly is he doing it for? This man is not going to come in contact with the patient. He's not, there's a partition between him and the patient. It's absolutely unnecessary. So we have to note our point of care, risk assessment. What am I going to do? What you are going to do is what determines the level of PPE you are going to wear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so another one says, I believe immediate testing for COVID-19 with the use of rapid test kits is important in preventing health, health workers at facilities. But without this, how do we think COVID-19 could be appropriately prevented in health facilities because of the nature of the presentation of the virus? Uh, thank you very much. So this is a particularly difficult question. And COVID-19 has been called the Schrodinger cat, and, or, or the Schrodinger's virus, like the Schrodinger cat, which is here and not there at the same time. The problem with the negative COVID-19 test, especially if it's, even if it's a PCR, is that if you are negative now, there's no assurance that you cannot become positive in the next 30 or 45 seconds. That's the truth. You don't know that. It's very possible negative as of now, like we say in HIV. The problem with rapid diagnostic tests is that it's not validated. And we are having sensitivity and specificity of just 40%, even in the US. And then you don't even know where some of these kids are coming from. So if they are insisting that all patients should have their tests done before you see to them. That's just for your own psychological frame of mind. There's no guarantee from any of those results that they are correct or they are positive or the patient cannot develop an infection later. That is why infection prevention and control is the key. 
we have to learn a way to do our work and at the same time protect ourselves. We have to learn to do our work and at the same time take care of the patients and at the same time don't become the patient. This is very crucial. Because even if you ask for a test, there's no guarantee that number one, the result may not come back on time. If the result comes back on time and the patient is negative, it can become positive the next day. We have seen cases like that. So this is very crucial uh, to, to note that, that IPC is the way forward. Thank you very much. Thanks. So this person is still worried about the spreading of the infection because some healthcare workers who work with infected persons get infected despite who are having PPE and all the precautions that they take. Maybe there's something we still don't know about the virus and its spread. Is there anything you have to say to this person? Okay, That's thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, sorry. Now, as somebody who has worked in isolation centers uh, in different parts of the country, and as somebody who has seen healthcare workers, uh, you see, don't assume that people are following instructions. I tell you, and I did it's difficult. And we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a session on it in a series later when we go through all the steps. You know, a lot of times when we go and do trainings, I will use the fluorescent light powder. Almost everybody, every, every single training we have gone to, people have failed, failed woefully. Even soldiers, even soldiers that are supposed to be the masters of other IG, they fail. Because by the time we put the powder on their hands and then you see the powder later, oh my God, you see, you see traces of the powder everywhere. So don't assume that, and this is why I tell people, PPE is not a be all end all. If you are wearing all the PPE in the world and you are not doing your hand IG, you are wearing your PPE, you, are not, you don't have other, 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 other processes in place, it will fail. And that's what we are seeing, that some people working at the isolation facilities all, uh, get infected. Also remember that exhaustion and fatigue is also a crucial thing. And then sometimes there's just errors in human judgment. So these things are real. So it's not because the people has been, it's not because we don't know, well, there's still the information we don't know about the virus, but we know to an extent, we know enough to an extent on how to protect ourselves, at least for now. But people getting infected is inevitable because there are a lot of errors in human judgment. And by the time you give 100 people something to do, they will not do it in exactly the same way. That has the reality of it. So it's very important to just uh, note all that. Thank you very much. All right. So there's another one here asking, what is your take? This person wants to know what your take is in management of cash in banks and communities. Management of what? Cash, money in banks and communities. No, no, no. Okay. So what, what we try to say um, is that, you know, because sometimes again, you see all sorts of things, don't do cash, uh, don't do that, that. Use, a, uh, use a toothpick to press the ATM, use your, all these things cause back to add IG. By the time we do our add IG, we are sorted. Because the virus will not drop from the body inside your system. The virus will travel to your hands. So once you take care of that vehicle, that mode of transmission, you are fine. So you can handle your body anyhow. The important thing is to wash your hands after touching your body. And if you cannot handle the body, then you can give it to me. I will handle it for you. So the crucial thing is to wash your hands. That's why I said hand IG is the crux of IPC. Once we sort that out, every other thing comes uh, as, as an addition, as an addendum to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So just to say that um, from the number of healthcare workers who are getting infected in Lagos and around the world generally, and the number of persons in this webinar at the moment and the number of questions we're getting, it's now become vital that we repeat this sort of sessions time and time again, so that people are aware and people are carried along with what is going on. And now not just the um, clinical staff, from your presentation, we can see now that even non-clinical persons who work in hospitals are getting infected. So would encourage owners of facilities to get as many people who work in their facilities to join into the webinars so that they can pick um, one or two information. All right, thanks. So another person is asking, do you allow patients who refuse to use the washing hand basin but the hand sanitizer to enter the hospital? No, 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 no. That's why I say you must be clear about your protocols. You must be clear about your practices. One of the things we had experienced earlier when we were doing screening at the airport is some of the big men refused to be screened. And some of them eventually came down with the infection. So this, this, this virus has been a leveler, sort of. So whoever is coming to your facility must wash his hands. That's why you give them options. Either you use your, 
you, if you have a hand, alcohol hand drop, you can use it. You can use your soap and water, but you must wash your hands. Because that man that is refusing to wash his hands will refuse to wear face masks. He will refuse to, he's the one that will bring 10 people into the facility. He will refuse to follow your instructions. And if he's not following your instructions, show him the door and tell him where to go. So it's very important. It's not a time. Look, we, we can see what's going on all over the world. Lockdowns here and there, no international flights. Okay? This has never happened before. So if anybody is not willing to comply, then it should go elsewhere instead of becoming a, a, affecting everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. So another question here is that in view of the fact that most COVID-19 patients are asymptomatic, do you then think that the infrared thermometer is an effective screening tool in the outpatient clinics? Well, I have a peculiar problem, a personal problem with the infrared thermometer. In my experience as a clinician, it's not reliable. Sometimes that thing, you do it, it will show you 35.2 or 34.6. I mean, that's just not compatible with life, you know. So, and it, it's not very reliable. And as a screening tool, not very effective, actually, if, if, if you must ask me. Because not just that a lot of patients are asymptomatic, a lot of patients don't have fever. A lot. That's the experience we are seeing. Some of them will just come with, the fever will have dissolved. But they now come in, they come with difficulty breathing. Because the average patient with fever will not present to the facility, but take malaria, it will not take malaria drugs. It is when the uh, uh, is it, it, when the malaria drug does not work that then they come. So, but we must have some form of screening. We can't just throw away everything because it may not work. There are still some people that this thermometer will pick. That's why we have it there. And the more people we can pick and reduce from getting into the general flow of patients, the better. But this is why I tell people at all my trainings that you see eventually. A COVID case will come to your facility. I don't care how you do it. It will still happen. But when you have these clinic protocols in place, it helps. It really, really helps, both uh, psychologically and realistically, to keep these patients at bay. It helps you and gives your staff, especially, the confidence that the manager is doing everything to protect them. Thank you. All right, thanks. So you mentioned the use of 0.05% chlorine as sanitizer. This person wants to know if the chlorine is in gaseous or liquid form and how it will be prepared. No, oh, the chlorine is in a, it's a liquid, it's a liquid form, not gaseous. Please don't put chlorine in gaseous form. It can, it's not good. Uh, it can irritate the respiratory mucosa itself and cause problems. Uh, chlorine is in a, it's, it's a liquid form. You know, if you are using your household bleach, this is 3.5%, and you want to make 0 0.05, you will first make 0 0.5, you put one, if you are using one liter of bleach, you put it in with six liters of water, one ratio six, that will make 0 0.5. Then one ratio nine of that will make 0 0.05. What we we'll try to do is to package the cleaner and disinfection into another section, especially for the cleaners, because the cleaners are very important here. If your cleaners don't clean properly, then it can become a problem. So that's how that's the shot on how to make bleach, but I think that should be dedicated to another webinar entirely on cleaning disinfection and the rudimentary of uh, and hygiene. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll look into that webinar and how people can gain from that. Okay, so this person is curious as to if the hand sanitizers really eliminate the virus because this person knows that they work best against bacteria. Yeah, very, very brilliant question. Thank you very much. Now, basically what we know is that it's an RNA virus. And RNA virus, viruses are not very strong. Unlike DNA viruses, if you, if hepatitis B, is on the surface. It can be there for three months, nothing there happened. But we know that with coronavirus, within maximum three days, just exposure to sunlight will kill it and it will die. So what we do, when you are doing your alcohol-based hand drop, is not as if what the alcohol does is to disrupt the viral envelope. But it's very important to also focus on that mechanical action of rubbing the hands. That mechanical action goes a long way to also breaking up the virus and removing it from your hands. So we know that ABHR, that's alcohol-based hand drop, is an antibacterial. But when you are using it for hand washing, it eliminates the bacteria and it also displaces the viruses from your hand. That's why you cannot do your hand. You have to rub it properly when you are doing your hand washing in a bit to displace and kill the virus and disrupt the viral envelope. Thank you. Thank you. So this person believes there will be a challenge screening people at entrances, depending on the density of flow staff, patients, relatives, visitors, students, and traders alike. So how do we manage this? How do we ensure screening regardless? 
Thank you very much. That's why uh, we said in the series that the first thing you want to do is to reduce your flow. So if you have clinics, for example, can you say, okay, for example, at the big hospitals, where you can have up to 100 patients at once, then you tell yourself, no, we cannot do 100 patients. We can only do 30 patients. So are we going to do more frequent clinics or we are just going to see the 30 patients and that's what we can accommodate? That way you reduce your flow drastically. We have had some places where they say, okay, we have 30 members of staff. Okay, 15 people should come on Monday, 10 people should come on Tuesday. We may 15 will come on Wednesday. Some people are coming Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Some are coming Tuesday, Thursday, depending. So there are very creative ways that we can reduce this flow. Some people, what they did was to create multiple entrances and exits so that people are not unnecessarily queuing in one place. And when you do that, then you screen them. You see, these things are not easy. These things are difficult. That's the truth. But we have to try our best and not be seen as complacent, like a desica or having a laissez-faire attitude, especially for those of us who own some of these facilities, so that eventually when, there's, when that patient inevitably comes, this, your staff wants to know the MD did his best. The management did their best. It's just that these things happen and then we can fight it together. Rather than you being seen as a careless person who does not care about the staff welfare, at the end of the day, an outbreak can have a mutiny on your hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kwari. So for time's sake, we'll just take two more questions and we would respond to other questions by email because we have over a hundred of them and there's no way we can take all of them. So this person is asking for clarity because in your presentation you mentioned one meter fine, at least two meters. And this person wants to know if it shouldn't be the other way around. No, we are saying that one meter is good enough. Okay, if you can do one meter, at least one meter, but two meters is better. If you can do six meters, excellent. Ten meters, beautiful. Okay, but at least one meter. What we know is that droplets usually travel for less than one meter. But we are just saying that, look, in case other factors are involved, Baba, for example, your village people wants to kill you or something or whatever, two meters, they cannot get beyond that. But if you are not comfortable with two meters or that, do three or do four. It's okay. But what we know is that it should not be less than one meter. That's very important. Thank you. All right, thanks. So our last question here before we end. This person believes we should also inculcate a competency assessment for health workers after training, even for non-core personnel like security or gatekeepers. So after this training, do we then do a good assessment to determine if and how such persons can be deployed? Yeah, so, so, so what we do is that, you see, uh, people, people have different uh, rates of assimilation. People have different rates of compliance. So what we do is what we call, uh, we call it the IPC facility assessment and monitoring tool that we use usually on a daily basis, sometimes twice a day, to try and assess the level of compliance, identify the gaps in the training, and then plug those gaps. So this is not something that you just train and walk away. You have to make sure that the people that we train they are also uh, following uh, the, 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 the thing we train them on. So it's very crucial to monitor, you know, because you can, if you do a competency just after the training, the, 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 uh, the reception rate there may be high and then depreciate as time goes on because these things are not easy. How many of us wash hands between patients? How many of us wash hands before seeing a patient? How many of us wash hands after seeing a patient? Most of us don't. So we have to have a way of monitoring we have to we have a way of evaluating and where there are gaps, uh, we have to have a way of plugging those gaps. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fari. I believe everyone when I say it was a very interesting and educated session. So it's just to show that we need to do this over and over again and probably even do one just dedicated to questions and answers alone so that people can ask everything that there or as many questions as they are worried about. So I would hand over now to Dr. Idowu to give a closing remark and then come back to close this meeting. Dr. Idowu, please. Thank you, Peggy. Um, but civilian things came out of uh, this very important um, webinar. One of it is that we cannot overemphasize infection prevention and control in, the, um, in trying to curtail the spread of COVID-19. And uh, we also must use protocols to ensure that we keep our staff safe. So if 
um, we need uh, infection prevention and control protocols and um, protocols in ensuring our staff are safe. We, can, we have one that has been um, developed by a farmer. We're hoping that Dr. Okbaoi would uh, help us to review it. But at least you can go to www.efarmeratlegostate.gov.ng, which is our website, to access the one we have currently. Um, we also want to say that um, as health workers, we have um, responsibility to ourselves, to our staff, to our community, to ensure that we um, do our very best in preventing the spread of the infection in our health facility. And at this juncture, I want to thank everyone who joined us today. We say that um, we cannot have had this webinar without you. Thank you so much. So Dr. Okpawe, as always, my team lead, thank you so much for the insightful lecture. And um, to my partners in progress, a farmer's partners in progress, farm access, we say a big thank you. And you know that we're going to have another webinar because so many things have come up from this one. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, thank you, Dr. Idowu and Dr. Pawe. Um, for the participants, thank you for attending. Please check our social media handles, a farmer and farm accesses, so that you're updated as to when the next session will be. Thank you for attending today and do keep safe. Bye bye.